Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to be pivoting a little bit because we're trying to get everything set up so people in the room and people online can see and hear everything well. I would like to welcome you all to Historic Geneva for our final spring lecture of this season. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I've got my usual advertisements because even though the lecture series is over with, we have a lot going on all summer and spring. So that's my advertisements for now. I do encourage anyone uh, who wants to know what we're doing, visit our website, sign up for our regular updates, and you'll get notifications about everything that's going on. And of course, become a supporter. Then you also get our newsletter, and that includes a bit more content as opposed to events necessarily. Um, so I do want to mention to those online that we are recording the program tonight. So uh, hopefully without any technical difficulties, it will be on our website sometime in the, uh, the future. Uh, so I wanna to get to tonight's speaker. I want to introduce Kathleen Earle, who is a native New Yorker whose ancestral roots go back to Pennsylvania, which I hear is how she got started on this journey. And uh, she's an author, artist, former professor, and former director of research at the National Indian Child Welfare Association in Portland, Oregon. She attended Cornell University and has a PhD from the Rockefeller College of the State University of New York at Albany. She has written and illustrated several award-winning children's books and many peer-reviewed articles in areas of mental health and child abuse. She currently lives in Tenants Harbor, Maine with her husband, Stan Fox. And tonight she's going to tell us about The Escape to the Lakes, a story of New York refugees from the Yankee Pennamite Wars. And if you don't know what those are, you soon will. So I'm gonna turn things over to Kathleen. Thank you. It was a very nice introduction. Um, I live in Maine, but I was born in Syracuse. So I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I moved to Maine in, uh, about 30 years ago thought I was going to retire there, but I guess I'm not really retired yet. So um, I'm an artist. If people Google me, they come up with me being an artist. But I've been a lot of things. I've been a researcher, an artist, and you all know people are not just one thing. There are a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I wrote this book because I was uh, searching for my ancestor. And uh, what I found is the Yankee Penamite War which some people refer to as the first American Civil War. And a lot of people never even heard of it. So I, I thought it was worth a book. So I, um, this is the guy I was looking for, John Earl, who was born in Geneva in 1795. This is his obituary. He lived in Ulysses, New York as an adult, had a farm, which actually goes right down to Taconic Falls. He, he owned Taconic Falls. But he had six kids and only one was a boy, so they sold off the land little by little. But anyways, born in Geneva in 1795, he was left fatherless at the age of 10 and drove a wagon train from Albany to uh, Ithaca to support his, his family. That's the story. And um, I, I started doing research on my family in 1796. I got back to this guy within five, 10 years. And then I couldn't find anything before that. And I spent 40 years, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> trying, to, trying to find who his father was and who his father's father was and all that. And my, char my great grandfather, Charles Fremont Earl, who, whose son went to law school at Cornell, graduated in 1905. Um, had supposedly done a genealogy of the Earls. He destroyed it, destroyed the genealogy. So I knew something was up, but I didn't know what. So um, I was talking to somebody and I had this much paper and I went through it and there was a lot of Pennsylvania stuff in there. I was talking to somebody and they said, you should check out the Wyoming Valley of Pennsylvania. So I called the Wyoming Valley Historical Society down there. And I said, um, you got any Earls down there in your records? And she said, well, let me look. She said, quick look, we've got the kidnappers. I said, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I hightailed it down there to find out what was going on. But let me talk first about Geneva when he was here. Um, supposedly, this is the way it was described by early historians. A small unhealthy village containing about 15 houses, all log except three and about 20 families. It's built partly on the acclivity of a hill, partly on a flat with deep marshes north of the town. 
to the presence of which ill health is attributed. Is there still a, a marsh in Geneva? I guess it's been filled no. in. I am thrilled to be in Geneva because this is where my ancestor was. I'm just so excited about this. The accommodations by Patterson on the lake margin are decent, but repose was troubled by the presence of gamblers and vermin. <laughs> and then another one written by a woman whose father had an inn. Soon after my father had come on west of the river and opened a public house, other settlers began to come in. The Indians were frequent visitors at my father's. I used to see them often, the chiefs, hot bread, jackberry, red jacket, and little beard. We brought in a few sheep with us. They became the especial object of the wolves. Coming out of the Wilson Swamp nights, their howling would be terrific. I could tell many stories of wild beasts in this region. We had no way to keep fowls, but to secure them well in their roosting places. The first settlers found it very difficult to keep hogs. The bears would come out of the woods and take them by daylight. I think things have changed a little bit. Yeah. Okay. But back to the kidnapping. In June 26, 1788, 15 young men kidnapped a guy from Philadelphia named Timothy Pickering. He had moved to Wilkes-Barre. And these are the people, and the, the, the ones in yellow are people who moved up here to avoid prosecution. And what I'm hoping is I'm doing three or four talks in upstate New York. Somebody will be related to these people because then we will all be buddies because we all kidnapped him together. Three of them are earls, you notice. Daniel, Solomon, and, Fr and Benjamin were all earls. The reason Benjamin's name is not in color is because he didn't come up here. He turned state's witness, and they let him stay down in Pennsylvania. I'm actually in contact with the descendant of Benjamin, but we don't talk about the fact that he turned state's witness. We just say, oh, we must be related. The ones in red are people who might have been up here, but I can't quite be sure. There were Woodwards. There were Taylors, but I'm not sure it's the same guys. But the Dudleys were definitely here. Joseph Dudley did not come because he was the only kidnapper who was killed in all of this. He was killed by a posse. Um, Wilkes Jenkins, Timothy Kilborn, and uh, John Whitcomb all came up here. And John Whitcomb uh, was the first non-Native person to be married in Geneva, New York. So, so anyway, um, the reason they kidnapped him was that uh, the Yankees and Penamites, the people from Connecticut and the people from Pennsylvania, both thought they owned the same land, basically. And I'll get into that a little more later. But King Charles had given the same land to both Pennsylvania and Connecticut. And so these two groups were fighting over the land, both thinking they had total title to it. And it went on from 1760 until 1787, when Pickering was sent to straighten this out. He sent him up from Philadelphia and said, you go there and fix, fix this mess. And so he came up and the first thing he did was jail the leader of the Yankees. And the leader of the Yankees was a guy named John Franklin, who was uh, loved by everyone, fought in the revolution, was on Sullivan's March, well-loved and well-regarded by everyone. And, um, they put him in a cold jail cell and he was freezing and he didn't get enough food. And so the Yankee leaders got together and said, let's kidnap Pickering and trade him for John Franklin. So they found these 15 young bucks, all of whom were already trained to fight the Penamites, jumping out of the woods with black face and feathers and war whoops and said, go take this guy and put him in the woods and uh, we'll help you out and then we'll trade him. So they took him to Tokanic, basically, and kept him in the woods for 19 days. And um, no help came. So he said, look, you guys are never going to help you out. Why don't you let me go? I'll, I'll watch out for you. So they did. And then he turned around and went after him. Story of everybody, right? Story of history. So where did this occur? This I'm sure you're all familiar with this map. I did this talk in... Uh, in Maine and nobody knew where anything was, but <laughs> it's basically down in the corner there where it says Susquehanna River. And these are the, the native names, the Haudenosaunee names up in New York. Canada Sega was Geneva, you probably know that. And um, basically that it was 
it was that bottom part below the border there, top part, top northeast corner of Pennsylvania where it occurred along the Susquehanna River, basically. And this is why it happened. King Charles II, his father, King Charles I, was overthrown by Oliver Cromwell, and he had to go and be raised in France as a child. And then when Oliver Cromwell died, he came back to rule Britain. And um, there was a concern that he'd take over the colonies because they'd been kind of left to their own devices. So the governor of Connecticut, went, John Winthrop, went to Brit Great Britain and got King Charles to give him everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific in a straight line. All that land was given to Connecticut. They left out a little piece for New York because the Dutch were already there. But basically they said, this is, this is now Connecticut. Now, if you see it overlaps the top of Pennsylvania a little bit. That was in uh, 1662. In 1681, King Charles II owed a lot of money to William Penn's father, Admiral Penn. And so in return, instead of paying him money, he said, tell you what, I'll give you this piece of land. And he gave him Pennsylvania. Hmm. So he basically gave them both the same land. And then they both bought it from the Haudenosaunee. They were happy to take the money or whatever. So, so nothing happened for a few hundred, well, almost a hundred years, 1753 the Connecticut people were running out of land in their little spot there because as you know, if you're historians, which I assume you all are, the land was passed down to sons. And of course, the more sons you have, the less land you have and pretty soon everybody's got an acre. So they said, oh, let's go live in our other land over in the, the uh, Wyoming Valley. And um, so in 1754, um, Susquehanna Company was formed to handle all the land deals in Connecticut. And the Susquehanna Company sent a bunch of surveyors in 1754, and they sold shares to land for $2 each for 600 acres. And they were so popular, they quickly had to up it to $9 for 600 acres. Then in 1762, the Connecticut people started to move. Okay, now before I tell you what happened when they got there, who was Timothy Pickering? Timothy Pickering, according to his biographer, Gerard, Gerard Clairfield, he was a young man on the make who didn't make it. He was a guy who, his family was from England. They were part of the first great migration. Everybody thinks of the migration of, of African-Americans up north as a, the great migration. But there was another one before that, which refers to the settlers from England from 1620 to 1640 which includes the Mayflower up to four, 1640. And um, so they, they were part of that, which by the way, all the kidnappers were also, they were all, their ancestors were all part of that group. And he was sent to Harvard by his father. He didn't like it, but he did bring chocolate with him to Harvard. And you'll find out later when he was kidnapped, he sent for chocolate. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> he uh, became a Colonel of the local militia in Salem, Mass, where he lived. Um, he entered the American Revolution as a colonel. He kind of made nice with, with the militia and worked his way up very quickly. But he was actually never more than a bureaucrat. He never fought. But in Salem, Mass, he challenged local doctor to a duel. And he left the church because of, fight, because of a fight with the minister. He was a Tory first. And then when he saw the writing on the wall, he became a, a colonial fighter. So people didn't really trust him much. And um, he was appointed quartermaster in 1780. And he got into fights with Washington because he wasn't doing enough to support the troops. So he was generally not well liked. But he did buy land in Connecticut from the Connecticut Susquehanna Company. And so when he saw what was going on, he said, send me down there and I'll fix it because he wanted to protect his land. So he went down there. But who was living there? Haudenosaunee. This is a picture of Oren Lyons. Has anyone heard of or met Oren Lyons? He is still at age 92, the faith keeper for the Haudenosaunee. And if you know anything about the tribes, the five original tribes, Onondaga's council fire. And whoever is the faith keeper at the council fire is the chief honcho. 
but the Mohawk were the keepers of the Eastern door, the Seneca of the Western door. And then the two little brothers were Oneida and Cayuga. The Tuscarora joined, joined in 1722. They were kicked out of the Southern part of the United States by colonial people. And the Haudenosaunee took them in. But the Haudenosaunee were really, really powerful. They were so powerful. I live in Maine and supposedly the rumors in Maine are if the Haudenosaunee came and stood on a hill overlooking a New England village, they'd just leave. They were very powerful. They, they subjugated or adopted all of the surrounding tribes where they were, including the, the cat people, the Hurons, the Erie, the neutrals. And uh, they used wampum belts. He's holding, he's holding the two row wampum belt. You know about the two row wampum belt? You do, but you people don't know about it. Basically, these people could not read or write. They used shells, they used wampum belts for treaties. And the Long Island tribes paid tribute in shells. And so they used them to create these, these belts. And the two row wampum belt basically is a white background with two rows of purple. And one row is the whites and one row is the Haudenosaunee. And this was their treaty with the Dutch in 1613. And 400 years later in 2013, there was a recreation of this on the Hudson River. Does anybody know about that? My niece happened to run it. Did you know that Allison ran this? She organized the whole thing. And um, they had, you know, white people in boats on one side and Haudenosaunee and canoes on the other side. And they went down the Hudson River. It was a big deal. Orrin Lyons was there. He's something. You can still find him on YouTube. But anyway, the population, everybody knows the population of the Indians was decimated when Europeans came here. And I use the word Indian because I've worked with native people for 20 years and they use Indian, mm -hmm. but I know most white people prefer native. So I tend to use native, but once in a while I slip. So excuse me if I did. But anyway. Um, Isn't that interesting? We think the white people think they're- Being nice, being I know. <laughs> exactly. I know, but among Indians, they use Indian. Exactly. So I know. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment on your maps. Yeah. The Susquehanna River is very important to this. And yeah. You don't have the Susquehanna on even the previous map. No, that's the Susquehanna there. That Susquehanna, right. uh, when it hits, it, it goes back north and goes all the way west at the border, all the way to um, Athens. Which is south, of, which is south of I forget what town in New York. Elmira. Uh, not quite that far. Then yeah. it goes directly south. Yeah, well, that's the Susquehanna is the one in the middle there, from my perspective, and it goes up, and then the Unadilla is on one side, and the Genesee is way over there, and the Hudson is over here. But it's important because that's where many of these people. Use the mouse if you want to use the pointer. So oh, okay. Know what you're pointing at. Okay, this is. Oops. This is Susquehanna right here. This is the Unadilla, which runs into it. This is the Genesee. This right. is the Hudson. So the, the Susquehanna is where many of these people escaped up to right. into New York State. Right. They followed it up, definitely. Right. Yeah. Yep. But if you look at the numbers of people, back to the numbers, by 1791, there were 25,000 Haudenosaunee in 1650. Mm. And then by 1791, there were 4,500. Mm. Today, there are 18,000 enrolled mm. Haudenosaunee. And I got this from the Haudenosaunee. So, because they don't like census, you know, they don't listen, they don't mm. take part in the census. But anyway, um, do you know what enrollment is? I'll do a brief side sidebar on enrollment. If you want to be considered a Haudenosaunee, you have to enroll. And in order to enroll, you have to be descended through all females. First of all, it's matrilineal. And each tribe sets a blood quantum. So for Cayuga, it's half. You have to be half Cayuga and your mother has to be Cayuga. It varies tremendously so that with the Western tribes, Cherokee, Cherokee you can be as little as 132nd either male or neither mother or father and still be. So there are a lot of, lot of white Cherokees. They have just a tiny, tiny bit Cherokee blood. Um, 
and they're allowed to set it themselves. Consequently, there are very few caves and they're disappearing fast. They're very proud of being, you know, being traditional. So anyway, um, that's who lived there. Uh, and the wampum belts were very important to their, to what they did. They used wampum belts with the Europeans when they came in contact with them. Now let's go on to the massacres. Now down to Wyoming Valley. There were actually two Wyoming massacres. I'm sure some of you have heard of the second Wyoming massacre during the American Revolution down in, uh, in Wyoming, Wyoming Valley. But the first Wyoming massacre was in October, 1763. Now remember, the Connecticut people had come there in 1762. And I forgot to mention that the Haudenosaunee had allowed the Delaware to live in Wyoming Valley. It was their hunting grounds, but they allowed the Delaware to live there, the Delaware tribe. And uh, so when the Connecticut people started moving there, the Delawares went to Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania had told them that they, they could use it as a hunting ground. And they said, you said no white people would live here and they're, they're whites. They said, well, they're not our whites, they're you know, Connecticut whites, but you know. And the governor of, of uh, Pennsylvania sent several letters to the governor of Connecticut saying, you can't let these people go here. We promised the Haudenosaunee they could use it and you're gonna get in trouble. Do not do it. But in April of 1763, several months before this happened, the Delaware village was set afire. 20 houses in the Delaware village suddenly burst into flame at once. And the chief of the Delaware was, was immolated. And everybody blamed the Yankees, the Connecticut Yankees. They called themselves Yankees. And Teddy Eskin, who was the leader of the Delaware, was the chief. And then the next year, or the next few months in October, 1763, Tedeschi's son led, a, led a, an attack on the village. But some people think the Pennsylvanians set it up because they wanted to get rid of the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Some people think the Haudenosaunee set it up because they wanted to get rid of the Yankees and because they didn't like Tedeschi because one, one value that the Haudenosaunee have even today is you can't be a big shot in order to be a chief. You have to be very low key. You're interested in peace and in helping the people. You're not gonna go, to go around shouting out who you are and how important you are. And T.D. Eskang did exactly that. So they didn't, they didn't care for him particularly. So um, about the same time this was happening, Governor Hamilton of Pennsylvania sent a bunch of soldiers to the Wyoming Valley and this was right around the same time as the massacre, but when they got there, it had already happened. But what he said is go there, read a proclamation saying they have to get out, arrest those who don't leave and burn everything. But when they got there, they ended up just burying people, supposedly. Now, one of those people was Lazarus Stewart and Lazarus Stewart was a well-known Scots-Irish guy who lived in the area. Has anyone heard of Lazarus Stewart? Boy, nobody knows any of this stuff. It's amazing. It's great. It's really interesting. It's it's complicated story, but it's really interesting. But Lazarus Stewart became important because he was he was kind of a he loved killing Indians, and supposedly his whole family was killed by the Indians. So I could see why he was like that. And he was from Hanover, Pennsylvania, and he originally was with the Penamites, and then he switched to the Yankees in return for getting land. They gave him land and he said, I'll help you get rid of these Penamites if you give me land. And so once he joined the Yankees, things went up a notch. They no longer just, you know, said, get out and jailed each other. They started dressing like Indians, putting on black face and, and burning the houses and ki cooking, kicking people out. And they, it really, really got worse. And actually two months right after this in December, yeah, uh, Lazarus Stewart viciously attacked and murdered the Canastoga Indians. He went to their village with a bunch of people. He just had it in for Indians, excuse me, Native people. So he went there and um, he went to their, and they were, they were a, a tribe that had welcomed the Pennsylvania people and given them food and helped them. And they were very much loved. It was Lancaster, PA, very much liked by the Pennsylvanians. 
And there were only six people in, the, in there. The rest were out doing something. So he murdered them viciously. And the Lancaster Pennsylvanians really loved these people. And so they took them and put them in the jail to keep them safe. So a day later, Lazarus Stewart went there, broke down the jail, pulled the people, pulled the Delaware people out, or the Conestoga people out, and murdered them viciously, cut them up in pieces. I mean, this was so horrific that Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter of protest, which is an historical document, because he said, these people helped us, and they were, they were our friends, and this guy should be tried and hanged and whatever, but he was never brought to justice, naturally, because they were only Native people. So sad, a sad chapter in our history. So the second Wyoming massacre was almost 10 years later. It was during the American Revolution. Meanwhile, what happened to the Delaware? In 1768, the Susquehanna Company sent more settlers to Pennsylvania. The Delaware people were sent to Ohio for their own safety. They were moved out. Um, Lazarus Stewart joined the Yankees. And between 1770 and 1790, battles escalated. More violent, more blackface, more feathers in their hair. And then the American Revolution occurred. And the Ameri this 24th Regiment of Connecticut Militia was formed in the Wyoming Valley by the Connecticut people, because by then it was mostly Connecticut people. And they thought they were Connecticut, so they formed a Connecticut regiment. But George Washington sent them all over the country because he needed them in different places, leaving the Wyoming Valley pretty much uh, you know, un, unprotected. And so all that were left really were old men and, and young boys and women. And of course, the, the British general Butler heard about this and he decided this was his opportunity to really get a decisive battle. And so he went down the Wyoming Valley with 100 to 400 British and Tories and 500, 700 Haudenosaunee. People don't realize that Haudenosaunee played a major, major role in the American Revolution on the side of the British, except for the Oneida and uh, the, who was the other one? Two of the tribes sided with the, was it Tuscarora? Yeah, sided with the Americans. But the other four all took the British side because the British had really wooed them. They had sent people there and worked with them and given them stuff and, and Americanized them as much as they could. You've probably all heard of Joseph Brandt. He was uh, one of the leaders of the Mohawk and he was sent to an American school, raised in an American school, became, well, okay, British school, basically became more English than the Englishman, joined the Masons, was a Mason. And during the battle at Cherry Valley, supposedly, one of the men inadvertently gave him who they were who they were about to kill inadvertently gave him the mason sign and so he said don't kill him he took him he took him aside the guy had no idea what was going on he'd inadvertently done it and the next day joseph brant said something to him about the masons and he said i don't know what you're talking about so he let him go but when the guy was freed he joined the masons so but joseph brant really was a very interesting man um so anyway, uh, Butler came and with all these people, there were seven, 375 people in the Wyoming Valley defending it. And they had almost a thousand British Tories and Haudenosaunee against them, but they didn't know that. They didn't know how many there were. They just knew they were gonna get attacked. And so, I'm sorry. Butler came from here. What? Butler, Butler's barracks from Geneva. Really? Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Cherry Valley. Oh yeah, well Cherry Valley happened after the Wyoming Valley yeah. Massacre. But what happened at the Wyoming Valley Massacre is that the 375 men and boys were not sure they wanted to fight. They had a, a town meeting mm -hmm. and some people argued to wait because there were some other people who had heard about it were gonna get there and help them out. It was gonna take a couple days. Lazarus Stewart argued against it. He said, um, he was really pivotal role. He said, what are you guys, chicken? You can't fight a few British and Indians? I mean, come on. And so he led them out. He led them out of there with a band playing St. Patrick's Day in the morning and an old American flag was falling apart. And basically what the Haudenosaunee did and what the, the British did is they, a few of the Haudenosaunee went out to attract the Wyoming Valley people 
And then they'd go after him and they'd back up like they were running away. And then they burned Wintermoot Fort, which belonged to a Tory. Wintermoot was a guy who was a Tory and he let uh, the British general go to his fort. Well, it was his house really, small fort in Wyoming Valley. And then they burned it to look like it was they, they were retreating. And so the Americans fell for it and they came out. And as soon as they were surrounded, these guys came out of the woods and, and basically murdered almost all of them. And they only had like 20, 20 casualties on the other side. And what happened after that is all kinds of stories arose about this battle, horrendous stories. And I can see you're not going to like this, but Queen Esther, you heard about Queen Esther? This was a story that came out of the Wyoming massacre that Queen Esther, and this is a picture, a painting of her done in 1905, and it shows Brant and General Butler next to her. I'll show you that's, see, where's my cursor? I think I lost my, oh, sorry. I can't use the cursor, but anyway. At the midpoint of this rock stood Queen Esther, clad only in a loincloth. In her hand, she held a huge war club shaped like a bird's beak with a rock firmly embedded. Her face and bare upper body were garishly painted with fearsome looking swirls and lines of alternating black and white. Large dead white circles had been painted around her eyes and the eyes themselves were like black holes. This was by, written by a survivor of the battle. For nearly an hour, Queen Esther had murmured and walked and implored, jerking her body spastically atop the rock and reaching her hands upward, beseeching powerful spirits to be with her, imploring them to make what was to come now a fitting retribution for the death of her only son, Gencho, who had been murdered um, July 1st, by the way, and tortured, tortured and murdered. So this was supposedly what happened. Abruptly, she signaled toward the warriors and several moved to the circle of captives and brought one of them to the front and made him sit with his back against it. Now, I went to visit the rock where this supposedly happened and it's only about that tall. You couldn't really sit by it. You'd have to lie down to be on this rock. But there's a big, you know, one of those New York State or this Pennsylvania signs by it saying, this is Queen Esther's rock. Hmm. But anyway, then Queen Esther stepped forward and gripped the prisoner by the hair, jerked his head until the back of it was against the rock and the terrified eyes were staring straight upward. Then with a scream of the word Gencho, she brought the war club down on the forehead with all her strength, crushing it as if it were more than an eggshell. Okay, guys, now we're going to talk about fake news <laughs> because there's no proof that this really happened. And in fact, the, the historians for the Haudenosaunee deny that it happened, that it was made up because they lost. They, they lost so badly, they wanted to have an excuse. So they made up all kinds of stories about this battle that are probably not true. And this quote was from someone down in Pennsylvania, one of the historical societies. She said, it's very hard for modern day historians to say we know exactly what went on during or after the battle when it comes to accounts of Queen Esther or Indian savagery. The primary source accounts that survive to this day on either side cannot be looked at as undiluted by emotions of some kind. Details may have been embellished upon or left out entirely to suit the teller of the tale, and to justify accusations, attacks, or retaliations. We do the same thing now. If you look at history books, the story depends on who wrote it. And that's what everybody's having a fit about right now. And for good reason, because the victors write history. Isn't who said that, Churchill? Somebody said that. Somebody important said it. But trying to get an accurate list of the dead is another logistical nightmare since it was weeks to months before any colonists came back to the valley to see what was left of their settlement or even bury the dead. These were summer months, so identification of the bodies was not always easy. The men, women, and children who were not killed outright fled the valley. Even those who surrendered to the fort were made to vacate the valley on foot. Some did not survive. Others simply never returned to the homes they started there. Now, I'm reading a book right now by Richard Cohen called Making History. It just came out in April. Uh, the Storytellers Who Shaped the Past. And the whole point of the book is that it's 700 pages. So I'm, it's gonna take me a while to finish it, but uh, his point is that history is affected by who wrote it. And we already know that really, but he uses an example, um, the decline and fall of the Roman empire. It was written by a guy named Edward Gibbon. 
But what people don't realize, and which came out about the same time this was happening, 1776, which is interesting. Uh, it took him seven years to write it. The first volume came out in 1776. He was a little short guy, four feet eight, extremely obese, ginger hair curled on one side of his head. When he proposed to a woman, she laughed so hard that he fell over. <laughs> they called him, they called him Monsieur Pomme de Terre, Mr. Potato. That would be Mr. Potato Head, I guess. He suffered from gout and he had a, a distended scrotum, which was so large it had to be, uh, had the fluid taken out regularly. So he was just a laughing stock. And yet he's one of the most revered historians ever because he wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And people use that book to predict what's going to happen with our country or Britain or whatever. But who knows what led this man to write or, or choose what he wrote? It's very, very interesting. Now, it's, people are not supposed to make things up when they write history, but they don't. But they choose. They choose what they're going to do. Anyway, after the Wyoming massacre, supposed massacre, because the native people still say it was not a massacre today, they're still annoyed by that. By the way, after that, Cherry Valley occurred and Cherry Valley was horrendous and vicious and nasty. And that's because the Haudenosaunee said, hey, they think we're murderers, we'll show them how to be murderers. But evidently they killed Tories as well as, as uh, Yankees in Cherry Valley, they killed everybody. And they did have women there who plundered and looted, whereas that was not true in Wyoming Valley. So the next thing that happened was Sullivan's March in retribution for the horrible Wyoming massacre. I thought it was for the Cherry Valley massacre. Um, well, it was for both, really. But they stood, they decided to do it right after Wyoming. It took them a while to get organized, but that's why. And there were still incursions of the Iroquois here and there, too. So they wanted to just get rid of it once and for all. So in 1779, Congress directed the campaign to punish the Haudenosaunee. Two major routes. One went, one rallied by Colonel John Sullivan, went up the Susquehanna River. That's the, let's see if I can try this again. There we go. He started actually down here in Easton went up to Wyoming Valley and then up here, this is the arrows for his, they went up to Geneva and over to Little Beard's town, which is Genesee, town of Genesee. Then Clinton was supposed to come down from Oneida Lake through Canajoharie. I'm not gonna use that anymore. On the Unadilla River, he was floating, floating a bunch of barges down. So Sullivan had 100 to 200 boats, 2,500 men, 1,400 pack horses, 200 cattle, not grass fed, no, probably where they're grass fed. <laughs> um, and so Clinton had almost the same number. And they met, they met up in, um, on August 22nd. It took them like three or four months to get organized. And people objected to this. A lot of people objected. First of all, Sullivan was not a Pennsylvania people person. They wanted a Pennsylvania person to lead it. The Quakers didn't want anybody to lead it. They were in favor of the Haudenosaunee. The uh, the Pennamites didn't want it. Didn't want to do it because they said the Yankees got what they deserved. And um, so they finally met up. And by then they had four thousand men, several hundred cattle, over thousand horses, and nine cannons. Well, Haudenosaunee took one look at this and said, we're out of here. <laughs> and so they basically, basically saw him coming. There were a few skirmishes. There was one at Newtown, which is Elmira, and um, one, another one around there. And they didn't really have another one until they got to Genesee. But meanwhile, there are diaries of the soldiers. And they talked about finding these wonderful orchards that went on for miles and corn that was 12 feet tall and wonderful vegetables and, and beautiful homes. And there were even feather beds in some of the homes. They really, the Iroquois knew how to live. They'd learned all this stuff from the, from the British. And the Iroquois are extremely resilient and extremely good at taking the best of both worlds, even today. So um, 
An interesting story is the story of horse heads. I don't know if you people realize where it got its name. It's from Sullivan's campaign. They got up there and they had to kill a bunch of pack horses because they were in such bad shape. So they killed the pack horses and somebody decided to cut their heads off and put them along the road. And so the town got the name of horse heads. And if you go to horse heads, there, there's a big wall when you come in showing horses. I'm wondering, I'm thinking, I wonder if they know how this town got its name. <laughs> But anyway, um, they also repatriated the adoptees who had been taken over the years. And I, I saw a quote back there from one of the diaries. We got to something, something village, it might've been Geneva, and there was a little three-year-old white boy and, and we took him and, and put clothing on him and somebody took him home. He spoke a little bit of English, but he spoke basically Haudenosaunee. The other thing is that after Sullivan's March, Every president of the U.S., according to the Haudenosaunee, has a name, and the name is Town Destroyer. But there were some slightly light moments in the Panamite Yankee War, which kept going on. It went through the American Revolution. It went through Sullivan's March, just kept beating each other up. And this is a story of a guy named uh, Bidlack, Benjamin Bidlack. Actually, I put James here. James was actually his brother who was killed at the Wyoming Valley. But he was a Yankee and he was out doing his business in the 1780s. And he was on a commercial venture along a river in Pennsylvania when he was captured by Penamites and they took him to a log cabin jail and locked him up. But he was a real great guy. He was a splendid singer and a merry fellow, according to people of the time, addicted to strong drink. He loved to tell tales and he started telling tales and singing songs and, and the guys loved it. And pretty soon all the Penamites were in there listening to him. They thought he was one of their, these great guys. And eventually he said, well, I could sing better if you let me out of, out of the jail. So they let him into the outer part, you know, and he, he sang better. And then one day he said, I've got a new song for you, but I need to do it on the steps and I need a cane. So he said, all right. And the song was called, um, an old swag, the old swaggering man. And so he got out there and he started singing the old swaggering man. And when he got to the line, here goes the old swaggering man. He jumped the fence, <laughs> and ran, took off. Half the guys fell down on the ground laughing. The other ones chased him. So, I mean, even though you talk about battles and wars, there were still friends among all these people. During the Wyoming massacre, there are there are accounts of people who, um, who were white people. There was one guy who was friends with, actually he was the father of one of the kidnappers. His name was, um, uh, I can't remember his name, but anyway, uh, Bud, Benjamin Bud. And he knew old Hendrick, who was a Mohawk and old Hendrick was there and he was, he was ready to fight. And Hendrick came to him and said, no, you don't, you want to get out of here because it's going to be nasty. He said, let me, let me put red paint on your face and you can escape. He said, well, my two boys are coming to fight on the side of the Yankees. He said, well, here's some paint for them. He said, you get those boys and you get out of here. And he gave them a horse to leave because they knew each other. They were friends. Some of the Penamites were friends with the Yankees. Some of the Haudenosaunee were friends with all of them. It was not all black and white, which of course it never is really in history. So anyway, Benjamin Bidlack walked 50 miles and went home and lived happily ever after. And interestingly, because my family comes from there and the Bidlacks were down there, our sister is married to a Bidlack who's a descendant of this guy, which is very strange. But anyway, so let's go to the kidnapping again. I'll tell you more what happened. In 1787, Pickering arrived in Wilkes-Barre. He was there for not very long. Remember, he put their leader in jail and then he was kidnapped. And these are some of the things he wrote in his diary. He kept an extensive diary, which he wrote in every day. And he said, wrote to my wife for camlet coat, two pairs worsted hose, one shirt, one pocket handkerchief, one towel, needle, thread, yarn, leather gloves, four yards, yellow binding, a bag, one pound chocolate. He did like his chocolate. One half pound soap, one pound sugar, one half choir paper, shoes, two quills, pen knife, Dr. Price's sermons, a fine comb. And then later he wrote, sent a large wooden spoon and butter spoon to Kilburns to be sent thence to my wife. 
And then he wrote, gave Woodward a letter. Woodward is one of the kidnappers. A letter dated yesterday to forward to my wife. Desired her to send me a small tin kettle with a cover. Woodward returned, says my things are at Marcy's with a letter for me. So it wasn't a terrible thing or deal that he was going through here. They taught him how to uh, do different things in farming, how to, how to take care of heifers and how to plow with oxen so you don't knock over the, the corn in the middle and all kinds of stuff. And they taught him how to make coffee out of bark. And he said, tis very good, you know, in his diary. But, then it, but meanwhile, on July 8th, there was a proclamation. Now, this was before. He was let loose on July 15th. But on July 8th, this proclamation came out basically offering a reward for some of the leaders, $300 for apprehending and securing John Jenkins, who was one of the leaders, $300 for apprehending and securing John Hyde, who was one of the kidnappers, and then $100 each for Benjamin Earl, Daniel Earl, Zebulon Cady, Wilkes Jenkins, Joseph Dudley, Gideon Dudley, David Woodward, John Whitcomb, Timothy Kilburn, and Thomas Kinney. Now, Thomas Kinney was actually someone who changed his mind at the last minute. They didn't know that. They thought he was still with the kidnappers. And so posses went out, started looking for these guys. And they actually, that's when they shot one of the Dudleys, Joseph. He ended up dying. And then um, this was Pickering's list of where everybody was. In uh, the Susquehanna Company papers, which is a great source. As I told you, it's wonderful for this. Um, it's, it's dated August 7th, but that's when it was published. It actually was written in July 29th because he mentions that Joseph Dudley is still alive. He was a prisoner at the time. But it mentions Daniel Earl, Solomon Earl, Daniel Taylor, Zebulon and Katie fled through the Great Swamp. So if you go from Tunkhannock up to Elmira, there was a Great Swamp somewhere along the way. Ira Manville and Benedict Satterley were put in jail. They were captured and put in Easton jail. And they actually um, were kind of not really uh, enthusiastic kidnappers. They went along with it. But they really weren't that interested. And actually when they got out, the Susquehanna company gave them each big pieces of land as a reward. So things still were not settled. Benjamin Earl turned state's witness, as I mentioned before, and he was in jail. And um, Joseph Dudley, they're wounded in a private house in wilkes Bear. He died later. John Whitcomb, David Woodward, John Hyde, Gideon Dudley, Joseph Kilborn were all flying toward Tioga. And um, Wilkes Jenkins fled to the lakes and Frederick Budd fled to the lakes. That's what he said, fled to the lakes. Are these names in your book? Yep. Okay. They're all in there. And I did a short biography of each one too, trying to trace their ancestry and who they were and what they did and where they ended up. Then, but there's a funny story. I guess I have enough time for my funny story um, about, no, or should I keep going? About eight, but, um, okay, I'll keep going. Benjamin Earl basically, before he was captured, was he'd just gotten married and supposedly was a little guy. This is one of the history books who had a, a large buxom wife and they had a feather bed. And so when the sheriff came knocking on the door, his wife said to him, get in the bed, and she lay on top of him, you know, with him under her. And there's a little, a couple of the history books about her saying to the sheriff, do you see Benjamin here anywhere, Sheriff? So he left. I like that, because it's an Earl story. So um, the indictment. This is really, this was on September 2nd. And it was quite, quite, it said, what happened is in the nighttime in 1788, with force and arms, with guns, knives, and tomahawks, these boys riotously, rudely, and unlawfully disturbed the peace of the Commonwealth, did assemble themselves and meet together, and basically having their faces painted and disfigured, the mansion of Timothy Pickering, then and there with force and arms, to wit, with guns, knives, tomahawks, did break and enter, and upon the said Timothy Pickering, then being with force and arms, as aforesaid, an assault did make, and the said Timothy Pickering, then and there, did beat, wound, and evilly treat. And him, the said Timothy Pickering, having first bound him with cords to distant parts of the country to carry, and there cruelly and ignominiously put him in chains and kept him prisoner for 19 days, exposed to their insults and the inclemency of the weather, so that of his life 
was greatly despaired. Then if you look at Pickering's diary, it says, a fire being quickly kindled, they began to cook some of the venison. Being hungry, I borrowed one of their knives and followed their example. I observed the hunter tending his steak with great nicety and sprinkling it with a little salt as soon as it was done. He, with a very good grace, presented it to me. So, two different stories. Meanwhile, uh, things were settled in favor of Connecticut, and then they were settled in favor of, of Pennsylvania. And things went on like this until around 1810, Connecticut made a deal with the US government that they would give up all their, their rights to the land in return for the Western Reserve, I guess, is how I understand it. And so then they had that money. And then the Western Reserve was, um, was bought by someone who sold shares. So I noticed when I was doing my genealogy, a lot of New Englanders end up in Ohio. I'm like, why are they in Ohio? That's the Western Reserve. But anyway, where did they go exactly? So I've got a slide here telling where these people went exactly. Now, Geneva, Solomon Earl, Daniel Earl, John Whitcomb, who's the one first marriage of a white person in Geneva. And Daniel Earl Sr., who was someone who was helping them, but wasn't one of the kidnappers. John Jenkins, Jonathan Swift, and then in Canandaigua, Gideon Dudley and his father, Martin, Elmira Wilkes Jenkins, and Unknown were the other ones. Um, so Whitcomb married a woman named Sarah Marsh on December 15, 1789. They had several children, and then around 1810, when things were resolved, he went back to Pennsylvania and bought his father's land for a reasonable price. The rest of them stayed, and I would love to find out where they are. If anybody out there knows any of these people, I would love to know where their, where their descendants ended up. So the Phelps and Gorham purchase, as you probably know, um, was bought from the Haudenosaunee and from Massachusetts. And that's on one of the slides back there, I noticed. Two and a half million acres. And they paid the Haudenosaunee a little bit, but not enough. And it was basically title. And the Haudenosaunee were not happy. But lot number 12 on here, if you can see up next to where it says Canada Sega, which is Geneva, was surveyed by Solomon Earl. 1789, Solomon Earl was a surveyor on that lot, along with Yankee leaders John Jenkins and John Swift. And John Swift is very well known around here, evidently, according to the history books, he became well known and became a well known person. He never got accused of doing anything with Pickering, as well as Solomon Earl, and then some other people who are related, related to the Yankees. So Tuscarora Braves came during the night and shot through the chinks between the logs and put a hole in Solomon Earl's jaw and killed Baker. So the next day, Earl was being taken to Geneva and the Tuscarora came back and took all their provisions. So they chased the Tuscarora down to Newtown, which is Elmira, and they, they had a trial. They got together, the pursuers created a trial and decided to execute the two braves that they caught. So they executed them. But one of them named Turkey, who was in on this, became well known again to the people, the settlers in the area and was a friend to a lot of them, fought in the War of 1812 and ended up dying of smallpox. But the, uh, the Tuscarora by then were, were really, um, not having a good time they were starving they were having a very rough time and so they were they were interested in food basically and then after that and they called out the first trial and execution solomon then became a ferryman on seneca lake and this is uh in 1790 he was a ferryman at kashan across the outlet of seneca lake near benton and this is a map from then uh, this map was created by Fred Powers, who wrote Kashong, a history, Kashong, a history. I don't know if you've seen it. It's a little known book. I got it from one of the researchers around here. Might have been Becky. I think it was Becky. Yes, Becky, who's the archivist here. Chapin? Becky well, Chapin? Yeah. Earl's Hill Road is down in that area. Earl Road? Earl's Hill Road. I know. Yeah. I've taken my picture by there. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, Solomon was down at the bottom there. Solomon Earl, if you look 
carefully, it says Earl right there crossing the water. And um, so basically um, it, they talked about finding Earl there. And another, another thing I read talks about him having a hole in his chin. But anyway, he, uh, he was there. And then I looked for, I was looking for my ancestors. So I looked for Daniel Earl. That's me with a blanket on. Mm -hmm. The day we went to Benton, it was freezing cold mm -hmm. and all I had in the car was a blanket. So I put a blanket around me. But these are the ones that are in Benton by Earl Hill. And basically the ones that are the Benton talks about a lot are Jephthah, which was Daniel Sr.'s son, Jephthah Earl, who is, was very well known historically there. But there was a, a guy who, who wrote a diary in 1791 saying between Cuba and Seneca Lake, which was evidently around Romulus somewhere, he found a log cabin built by Daniel Earl where he'd sowed a crop of wheat. And Mr. Budd, who was probably the kidnapper, Frederick Budd, and Mr. Tubbs, who was actually the son-in-law of Daniel Earl, um, were living nearby. Daniel Earl's daughter, Molly, was married to Enos Tubbs, another one of the Yankees. So um, I went to Benton in 2022 and I found their gravestones. It was so exciting. It was really great. Molly and her parents were there. But the kidnapper, Daniel Earl, was a different Daniel Earl. I think he was related to this. I think this one was his uncle. But anyway, that Daniel Earl, um, is shown in the 1810 census living in Ulysses, New York, which is where John Earl had his land. So I'm pretty sure that's his father or one of the brothers of Daniel and Solomon was his father. But that's irrelevant uh, to my story here. But I did find my ancestors. It was very, very fun. Earl's Hill was actually named after Jephthah Earl, who was Daniel's brother, Daniel Sr.'s brother. So where are the Haudenosaunee today? These are the locations of the, uh, basically the reserves. And um, they're all over the place, but they have sovereign status. You know, if you're familiar with, they're so considered sovereign nations, the six tribes of the Haudenosaunee. And that means the state can't interfere with them. But in what happened was um, state law does not apply to them. They have their own tribal police. If you watch the movie Frozen River, they're chasing people onto the res. As soon as they get the res, they go scree because they can't go on the res, the state police. Mm -hmm. The federal FBI do have precedence in some cases, murder, sexual abuse, some of the things the FBI are in charge. The Indian Reorganization Act was passed in 1924. And basically it was meant to help, help native people get their lands back. But it also said, if you want to get benefits from the federal government, you have to write a constitution like ours. You have to have a legislature. You have to have elected leaders. And then you'll be able to get benefits from the federal government. Otherwise, forget it. So three of the tribes agreed, Oneida, Seneca, and Mohawk. And interestingly, that's where the casinos are today. Three of the tribes said, no way. Cayuga, Onondaga, and Tuscarora. And even today, they are in much worse shape financially. But as I said before, they're very proud and they're happy. And also, of course, on the Oneida, Seneca, and Mohawk reserves, there are still traditional people who follow the old matrilineal ways. And, um, and it's fascinating. I spent a month living with the Mohawk and it was, it was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, very peaceful and happy and they were trusting and loving and generous. And it was like a, a small community of friends. It was like a small town. We, we grew up, it's my sister Betsy. We grew up in small towns. You know, and I, they have drag races at Aquasasne every Friday night. And um, so we would go to the drag races with the woman I was staying with and all her grandkids and they'd all line up on the bench. And the little one came to her one time, it must've been five and said, Grammy, I want a soda. She's like, here, gave him a dollar. He toddled off into the darkness came back with a soda, you know, she had a big pot of food on the stove every night and people would stop in. She didn't know who, but she always had food for them. It was really, really instructive. So, and they're into lacrosse big time, of course, you know that. This is a poster on the Aquasasne reservation. And there's a quote that I found 
somewhere along the line, which, which describes the whole attitude of the Haudenosaunee. We are born free and united brothers, each as much a great Lord as the other. Well, you are all the slaves of one sole man. I am the master of my body. I dispose of myself. I do what I wish. I am the first and the last of my nation, subject only to the great spirit. And they still do that. They still believe that. Even the people who bought into the federal government requirements still feel that way and act that way. And um, they're practical. They'll take a 200-year-old drum, powwow drum, and hook it up to an amplifier. You know, they have fun. They're accepting, not angry or hostile. They're very, very interesting people. Um, I was I went to many many conferences and my job as director of research. And I was out I was at a conference one time sitting with three uh, three native women, and we were just chatting and and two white women came and sat with us and they said, oh the sunset was so beautiful last night did you see the sunset? And you know it's just so gorgeous here and going into this whole thing about how wonderful and beautiful the land was and they said oh yeah yeah you know, and then they wandered off and. One of the native people turned the other one and said, so we're going to go to Target, right? <laughs> and I just people. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. That's it. So. I don't know if anyone online has questions and wants to put it in the chat, we'll pull it up so we can answer them if need be. And also, if I guess there were some problems with problems audio. with the audio <laughs> and video. Uh -oh. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm bad. not sure what happened there. But um, I, if you have any questions and want to put them in the chat, we'll do our best to answer them. Or if anybody here in the room also has any questions uh, that you haven't asked already. Yeah. I noticed in the listing you hit for Pickering that it was in Canada. Yes, I forgot yeah, to mention that. Repeat that for the folks yes, online uh, here. <laughs> yeah. Timothy Pickering was in Canandaigua in 1794. He was he was quartermaster after the whole thing with the Yankees, and he didn't have enough money, and he he really needed a job, and so they made him uh, they made him Indian agent basically. So he came to Canandaigua, which is probably when the the Yankees that were here left. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Some of them went to Canada after all, but he was appointed Indian agent, and he felt that. The native people were like children and they needed someone to tell them what to do. And so he was very paternalistic. Well, there's a Pickering treaty that they celebrate in Canada. Yeah, I know. They're really into Pickering over there. The details of that, but... Yeah, well, I guess he gave some of the land back to the Seneca because he felt they did get really the shaft in the whole deal. But he also felt they needed someone to be an Indian agent to work with them because they weren't capable of taking care of themselves. So it was kind of a two edged sword. Mm -hmm. But Washington was so happy with him at that point that he made him, uh, what was it, Secretary of War. Mm -hmm. So he became Secretary of War wow. after that. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Anything else? Nope, I don't see any on our chat. So I guess everybody got what they were looking for. Well, I would like to thank you all for joining us tonight, yeah, both online and in person. And uh, do come and join us again in the fall. Uh, though we won't, I think, have them online because we're going to go outside the museum with our presentations in the fall. So keep an eye on our website to get more information about what's coming up. But we've got a lot going on. And thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, everybody nice have meeting a really you good all. Good night. Yeah.